Brandon Marcello from 247 Sports, really excited to get you on. And Brandon, obviously, you know, you you cover the whole college football spectrum. We've talked about it a ton on here, and, and we have some questions for you on that. But I do have to ask you, as somebody that that watched Jalen Hurts and the situation, you know, him going from Alabama to Oklahoma and, and watching him turn into, you know, one of the elite quarterbacks on an elite roster I give you in the NFL, how surprised are you to see the success, not only that he's had early, but just overall in general when looking at his career path? I, he's improved drastically. I remember covering an, an Iron Bowl where Auburn beat him, and the the whole kind of book on him was that this guy they won't allow him to throw anything really beyond the yardsticks. Mm -hmm. They were trying to throw everything behind the line of scrimmage because they didn't really trust him all that well. And it's amazing just to to see his growth as a quarterback. And I, I think the best thing that happened to him was was to go to OU and play for Lincoln Riley and be provided some confidence and um, some, you know, to play in a different offense. And I think that helped him grow more than anything else than maybe he even did at Alabama. Yeah, and then you look at, at what's going on with the San Francisco 49ers right now and Brock Purdy, a guy who started every year at Iowa State, had an offer from Nick Saban and them coming out. How important, Brandon, and I know it's important, but you know, we, we typically don't see guys now on the transfer portal start for four years, just like in college basketball. It's hard to get a guy to stay for, you know, three years now when if, if he's even close to worth his salt and has a little bit of height and length on him. How shocked are you to see Brock Purdy? I know the pieces around him, similar to Jalen, are, are very good, but he's not making mistakes. Can't say that for Dak Prescott. Heck, you can't say that for a lot of quarterbacks who've been playing a lot longer in the NFL than Brock Purdy. Is this one of the biggest surprises to you and... Does this, we had a question in the Booster Club, does this make you think Stetson Bennett may have a chance to do some things? And maybe so. Stetson Bennett, I think, has got to be in a, in a very good situation, similar to Brock Purdy. I think if you've switched Purdy with Dak Prescott, I think that Purdy, based off of his past, would probably be making a lot more mistakes. He doesn't wouldn't quite have that talent around him. And in Iowa State, he, he made quite a few mistakes still, so... But what he's doing in San Francisco has been fantastic. And as you said, he isn't making mistakes, and there's been plenty of opportunities to do so, even in the in the against Dallas this past weekend and watching that game. And there were some situations he was put in where I'm going, well, usually there when he was at Iowa State, with him moving around the pocket like that and him throwing that ball, he's throwing an interception there, some big yeah. time mistake. And he's just not doing that. So um quite quite the surprise from Brock Purdy. Yeah, before I kick it over to my six foot seven friend here to my left, I do got to ask you: Tennessee, ex, you know, it reworks Josh Heupel's contract, making him uh, he's making nine million dollars a year now, as opposed to the five, I believe, a year that he was making. They've had their best season in, in a long time off last year. You are losing Hendon Hooker. You're losing some pieces on the outside, Jalen Hyatt, guys like that. Is Josh Heupel, Brandon, the guy that is going to lead Tennessee? back to sustained prominence. Not, not one year out of every three or four, but sustained prominence in the SEC. Have they found their man? I think they found a guy who won't get them to a point where they're losing, having losing seasons every three years or something like that. I think he's a coach that will always be above 500. Now, that's not good enough. At <coughs> um, he's going to win 10, 11 games every couple of years, maybe a few years, I should say. I'm not sure he's going to be able to get them to a national championship, but I will say this. They've taken advantage of this situation through recruiting. The defensive recruiting has been doing so much better here the last couple of years, not just recently. And I've said before, even going into this past season, I thought Tennessee could be a 10-win team this past year. They did that. I'm not so sure that's next season they can do that in 2023. But mm -hmm. 2024, because of the defensive pieces they've got there, I think that's a team that will be built to finally contend against Georgia for the SEC East, or if the East is even around them when the conference expands, <laughs> but compete and win an SEC championship and an SEC title. They're going to have windows like every other team every three years or so. But Josh Heupel has been a fantastic coach, and they have capitalized. And I think more importantly for him, listen, right, listen, Personally for him, $9 million a year is fantastic. Yes. But he also got them to commit to his staff there. They've yep. committed about $30 million into helping build that staff and keep them around. Um, they're doing everything right, it seems, right now at Tennessee. Let's see what they could do this year. And as you said, got to sustain the success. Mm -hmm. and by the way, I also think 
you know, you hear the, the this price tag come open. I'm sitting there wondering how much is Michigan going to play pay Jim Harbaugh? Yeah, they you got all these coaches, almost a dozen now, getting paid nine million dollars a year, and Harbaugh is nowhere near that right now. I know he's going to get a raise here this year, and there's this weird relationship he's got with his AD Ward Manuel, who I I'm not even sure he's going to end up being the AD there here in a year or two. Mm. He's just him and the president Jim Harbaugh, and I wonder when you get a president involved in like negotiations and doing yeah. all this stuff, <laughs> things don't usually go the way of the school as far as benefiting them. I think Harbaugh is not only in a position of power, but man, if he really wanted to kind of twist their arm and put it behind their back. He, he'd get $10, $11 million a year out of them. You know Nick Saban, because he has that clause in his contract where he has to be the highest paid mm -hmm. coach. He's like, please pay Harbaugh. Like, Go for it, Jim. Go for it, Jim. I dare you. I absolutely dare you. It sounds like he's going to command $11 million a year, but what's funny enough with the incentive-based contract he had, he made about $10 million this past year, and it worked. And that's why part of me feels bad for Ward Manuel. It's like, you did your job and it worked. But, you know, there's only so few coaches who can lead you to back-to-back -to -back college football playoffs. You need to pay the guy and keep him in Ann Arbor. Since you brought him up, there's, there is all these sort of NCAA violations that have come out because Jim Harbaugh bought some French fries and a cheeseburger over at the fries. Brown Jug. I hope, I hope for the sake of them that they got some of the, uh, the fried cheese balls because they are amazing mm -hmm. there. You know, we, we, last time we talked, Brandon, incoming NCAA president, Charlie Baker, <clears throat> talked about him a little bit. When I see the NCAA not respond to a $13 million NIL deal at Florida that falls apart, you know, or if it goes through, that's fine too, but then a cheeseburger deserves investigation. To me, the NCAA has lost all authority over college football. What say you? Oh, yeah. It's been like that for really the better part of a decade, and it's just gotten worse now. And they're like small town cops. Like, oh, we can go handle a hamburger. We can't go handle yeah. some massive <laughs> bank robbery. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, that nuclear yeah, plant facility investigations on the fritz. <laughs> That's such a good way to put it. <laughs> I mean, it's like small town cops re reacting to the bank robbery in the movie Heat. That ain't going to work out. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny because um, I was watching the Bernie Madoff thing. The, the FBI comes in and asks Bernie Madoff, is there a simple explanation? Like, you, give us one and we'll leave. He's like, no, nah, I can't do it anymore. It's a, it's a Ponzi scheme. I tricked you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, the NCAA, I, I don't know if they'll ever get to a point where they're going to, you, you, that colleges, universities should be afraid of them anymore. That's why, I mean, listen, credit to Jim Harbaugh, any any coach, don't cooperate with the NCAA. Mm -hmm. They're cops. Don't yeah. talk to the cops. The lawyer tells you not to call, talk to the cops, then if you're Jim Harbaugh, don't talk to the cops. Just yeah, let me to hit. It's a well, hamburger. Well, the Penny Hardaway, you know, Penny Hardaway at Memphis, they were like, yeah, you're suspended for this. Like, nah, no, I'm not. Like, that moment was like the first time you beat your dad in basketball in the driveway when he played hard. Yeah. You know, you're like, hey, wait a minute. I can do this. I can do this. No. How about no? How about no? They finally came up with enough strength to tell the NCAA to go shove it. Are you going to ask about yeah. Alabama? The new OC? Yeah. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Uh, yeah. Gonna, Brandon, who do you think is going to be the new OC at Alabama? And how much does a flight cost from Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> that would be an awesome hire an amazing hire and i'd love to see that um just because of just the the you know getting ryan gosling on your staff would be something <laughs> it'd be um, great uh i think yeah, i think greg roman yeah greg Ooh. Roman. okay that's a good I think one he'd be an interesting fit uh, or jeff levy mm. what do you uh, uh, from what do you think about Jeff you. Scott? Jeff Scott at Clemson, who just left USF. Do you think, or do you think he just wants to stay in the in the tribe there at Clemson and get back in their version of our trust tree? I, I, that'd be that'd be interesting. I don't know. I don't know if he would take the job. My understanding is that his family is already back there in Clemson. His kids want to keep going to school there, and that's why they moved there. And uh, he might want to stay in the tribe there, and obviously be on staff staff, on on-field staff here in another year or two. I, my understanding also was that after everything went down at USF, he, he was telling folks around him that I don't want to coach this year on wow. field. So, yeah. okay. Uh, but when Nick Saban comes calling and you're like, if I take that job and I'm good for two or three years, heck, mm -hmm. I might end up getting a better head coaching job than one I just got fired from. So, you know, we'll see. But I really like the names I've been hearing pop up. Greg Roman. Yeah. And, and Jeff Levy. And Levy's got a big buyout at OU, so we'll see. 
Yeah, w- without a doubt. I just, you know, I'm just waiting for Scott Frost or, or Brian Hartson to hop in there. Anything, uh, go ahead, Blaine, you got another one? Yeah, <clears throat> Brandon, I was going to ask you about uh, Colorado and Deion Sanders. They flip another five-star in Cormani McClain. It's two years in a row that Deion's doing this. At what point do you see it happening at all that Deion takes Colorado or maybe just get him uh, relevant to the playoffs? you think he'll be able to do that there? If he continues to go on this trajectory and no one stands in his way at Colorado, yes. And I'll say this, guys, Colorado, they couldn't even get transfers to come in because of all the academic requirements. I mean, they had to provide a list yeah. before Dion got there, a list to the administration before they could even go start going after guys in the transfer portal. So they kind of like just did away with it. They weren't even a transfer portal type of program in recruiting. And now they can go out and do that with Dion. Dion's the type of guy, he's a mover and shaker, and he gets things done. He's like, I want this to happen. Can you do it for me? Yes or no, tell me now. And then he can go forward with it. And um, if they get to a bowl game this year, which I think they're going to because the entire roster is practically going to be brand new and they've got enough pieces there to do so, I think by year three, Colorado in in that Pac-12 is going to be in the Pac-12 championship game. And Mm -hmm. if they win a Pac-12 championship at Colorado, they will be in the college football playoff. And I think by year three, he could have them competing for a Pac-12 championship there based off of the the direction they're going, the recruiting efforts. And it's only going to get better for the recruiting, even if they struggle this upcoming season. I mean, listen, he's starting from the bottom of the barrel at Colorado. Even mm-hmm. if they win like four games, he's still going to have something yeah. to sell there. Yeah. So, I mean, they get, the, guy, the guy's been phenomenal. No, no, he has. I mean, uh, if they go do some things at Colorado, you talk about getting some momentum. And it's funny you bring up the back, uh, the Pac-12, Brandon, because look, you're from the South, I'm from the South. We know the SEC is dominant in college football. But I tell you what, man, I'm looking at the Pac-12 in 2023. This is the best I've ever seen it. But like, at least from a preseason standpoint, you never know what's going to happen on the injury front or whatever. And, you know, we give the Pac-12 a hard time sometimes in football. But you look at what, just at the quarterback position, what's coming back in that conference with Penix at Washington, rising at Utah, Caleb Williams at USA. I mean, even Delora at Arizona. I can go down the list. Bo Nix at Oregon. Uh, DJ Hugo in Oregon State. Is this the best year, at least leading up to, that the Pac, is this the closest they've ever been to to being a dominant conference or getting as close to they've ever been to the SEC? Because, I mean, I look at what the SEC is returning at quarterback, it ain't even close. No, it's not close. And I think the Pac-12 is going to be, in the end, potentially the second best Power 5 conference in the country next season, based solely just off of what you mentioned with the quarterbacks here. And also, by the way, look at those quarterbacks that they have. Not a lot of homegrown talent. A lot of no. those guys, most of them are transfers, even yeah. within their own conference. You mentioned, you mentioned Jaden. So, you know, the Pac-12 notoriously has been like, oh, we got California guys, and they're good quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And But no, they, these guys have transferred in to play there, and the majority of that conference has quarterbacks that would start on practically mm-hmm. any team in the SEC right now. The I, funny- I don't know when you can say that. The funniest thing is the high school quarterbacks that are elite are leaving California to go to the South, and some Southern quarterbacks <laughs> are leaving the South to go to California. That's what I find absolutely fascinating. But, Brandon, Wild. it's always fascinating to get you on, my friend. Check him out at 247 Sports. Does a hell of a job. We always appreciate you taking some time, brother. All right, gentlemen. Appreciate you guys. All right. Be good. Hey, YouTube, we appreciate you checking us out. Do us a favor. Go subscribe. Turn that notification bell on. And like this video. All of it helps. We're going to continue to grow and continue to try and make this the best sports show. And you guys are the main reason. Because without you, there is no us. So give us a little help.